All right, good morning, Journey. How are you guys doing? Oh, come on, a little bit more than that. I mean, you guys are second service. You should be rocking a house by now, right? Hey, I am Ed Hanna. I'm one of the pastors here at Journey. I want to thank Pastor Eric so much for sharing the teaching and the preaching opportunities here. I promise Eric will be back next week. It's not a coup. We're not taking over the church or anything like that, all right? So, um... But I want to give out another shout out to the, the newcomer. If you're a first time guest or a second time or if you haven't attended one of the newcomer lunches, this is a perfect opportunity today. You landed on the right day to come back and, and experience and worship with us here at Journey. Right after second service, right down the hallway, there will be a uh, lunch provided for you. You have an opportunity to meet some of the pastors and just kind of get to know us and ask some questions if you would like. So let me get right into it. Um, we are covering a gospel center community. And in gospel center community, you know, we're, we're dealing with a lot of uh, relationships. We've kind of figured out, uh, you know, what it was to, to be in community with God and everything. And this week, you know, we're going to touch on another aspect. And, you know, as I was thinking about this this week, I, I realized that I really like to win. I really like to win. I mean, I... I like to be on teams that are number one. And I was thinking back uh, about a softball team that I was on back in my 20s when I was way much more athletic than I am now. And we actually got to go to the national championship for softball, right? That, that's the only cool part of the story, that we got to go there, right? We didn't win. We weren't champions, okay? But that's just it, right? I mean, people don't come up and ask me and say, hey, Ed, tell me about the time that you got to go, right? And nobody does that, right? Nobody, you know, there wasn't like some big movie drama thing or anything like that, you know, where somebody forgot a registration card or something. It was like a last minute entry. Nothing, nothing like that. We just left Ohio, went to Indiana, like the next state over, right? Played for a couple of days, didn't get into the championship, but yet it was still a great experience. And we do this, though, right? I mean, we like competition. We like to be on the winning team, right? I don't think I'm the only one who is like that, right? I mean, think about our entire way our entire society operates. I mean, Super Bowl is the largest viewed event in, in America, right? Why else would they, somebody have to pay so much money for commercials, right? Uh, think about the PGA Tour, you know, just, you know, everybody knows who's on top, but nobody knows who's in the middle, right? Th uh, think about your, uh, your game shows, Price is Right. Everybody likes to watch that person standing up and down and jumping, going, I won, I won, I want a new car, you know, kind of thing, right? Yeah, fashion competitions, we've got whole channels dedicated to this on cable TV. I mean, you guys, if you don't have cable, you're missing out, I'm telling you, okay? I mean, whole channels dedicated to this, right? To where there's a fashion competition. I would never wear any of the stuff that they make, but it's always just so interesting. Like they won off of that, really? Okay, right? Uh, we've got uh, cooking shows, you know, competitions on cooking. God, it, it goes on and on. Marriage shows. It, 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 there is no limit to the way that we will make competitions. It's even infiltrated into our movies, right? Because just a little while back, there was this movie saga series called Twilight, right? And there was this whole Team Edward and Team Colin. Even the girls got into this and said, yeah, we got a team now, you know, kind of thing. Guys, if you don't understand, it's okay. Just ask your wife or your girlfriend. They'll explain it later. But I, we make everything into a competition. You know, even our kids, you know, we got the little bumper stickers that says, you know, my child is an honor roll student at so-and-so school, right? Or an A-plus student, you know, my child beat your child because he's A-plus and yours is on the honor roll, right? I mean, we do, all over the place, we were looking for ways to make ourselves the best, right? I mean, think about it. I and mean, we ingrain this into our children from the very early age, right? As you, as you're kick your son or daughter out the door on their way to school in the morning. You know, you're not saying, go get some D's and F's, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know? Shoot for mediocrity and get C's, you know, kind of thing, right? No, we don't do that. We, we tell them that they can do great things and that they should work to get A's and B's. And 
Rightfully so. I mean, I, I don't want to sit here and tell you guys that in gospel community that we shouldn't strive to be the best, that we don't have a God who's not a God of excellence, and that we shouldn't look for those things. You know, the scriptures even teach us that we should work heartily for the, for the Lord. But one thing that I've noticed is what we believe, what we truly end up believing is that every team or community that we're involved in is the best because of me. We really love being a functional savior for our communities. Being a functional savior in community basically puts me in the center and removes God. See, we view our relationships through these lenses of a, as a functional savior so that friendships and relationships will give our lives meaning. Through friendships, we can avoid being lonely. We can have somebody to celebrate with. We can work with somebody on shared goals and our accomplishments. We can have find support in the hard times. Someone, you know, that we look at these friendships and relationships on just a horizontal level. And I want to challenge you today that we can actually transcend our relationships to look something different when we throw God in the middle and we take ourselves out of it. And it's not that friendships and relationships and marriages are wrong because we've learned that God's created us to be in community because God is a triune God. He's in community. He's created us to be in community. So our relationships are not the bad thing. It's how we come and approach them and it's how we view them. So let's kind of get to look at this today. And I want to challenge you, what if every friendship or interaction we have is intended by God to shape us, to form us, and to change us spiritually for his purpose and his glory? So let's see what this looks like in Acts 16.26. And I want to kind of preface this a little bit as well, that we're going to go through a lot of scriptures today, so if you're old school Baptist or Pentecostal and you've done your Bible sword drills today, then you should be good to go. Um, otherwise, you guys may want to look at the screen or use your uh, electronic device, okay? So here we go, Acts 16, 26. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God. And also in Romans eleven thirty six, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Did you catch that? That God made. Not Ed, not Joe, not Sally, not Susan, not anyone else, but God. We can't even make that claim. I mean, I've got some kids, but I can't say that I made them myself. It took me and my wife, birds and bees, right? Okay? It takes, we can't make that claim. God created out of nothing. We can't even think of nothing without first thinking of something. And yet God has this claim that he not only made man, but he's, he allotted time, that he set the boundaries. And you notice that all these pronouns, God, he, right? And he is with a capital H, right? Because God made. So he allotted the time. He set the boundaries. It's for him, God and through him as God and to him as God all things there's not even a list it's like it's just just easier just to say all you know the chair that you're sitting in for God to God through God that you have that chair your relationships that you have is to God from God for you know so God can get the glory out of it it Everything that you have covers under this. Why has God done this? <clears throat> so we can seek him. So we can seek him. So we can give 
him the glory. It is not about us getting the glory. It's not about us being in the center of the relationship. It is always about him and our relationship with him. But what happens most of the time is we tend to place ourselves in the center of our friendships, our marriages, our families, our work, our relationships at school, everyone we meet. And so when things start to go south, and they do go south, we become the functional savior, right? We step in and say, I'm here to save the day. Look at me. I know the answer. Look to me. I've got it. Look to me. Do what I do. Or if you're not that kind of person who jumps in and takes control of the situation, you're the one that sits back and says, no, see, I told them they should have listened to me the first time, right? Yeah. Either way, we had the answer. Think about it. it in, in recovery and addictions in, uh, circles, <clears throat> there's this thing called codependency. It's a whole thing built up on the fact that people will put their whole lives around the addiction and what's going on with it and why why the person has the problem and just continues on and they continue to feed off of what's happening because they can maintain control and they can try to continue to be the functional savior for what's happening in these people's lives, the addicts. You know, also, you know, maybe you're, you're not in the addiction cycle or the circle, but maybe you're a parent we have this term called helicopter parents. Have you ever heard of this? It's where you hover over your child, right? Your child goes over here, you're like, you know, you know, kid goes over here, right? You're just going back and forth. Your child doesn't get out of your sight, you know, kind of thing. You're like, ah, Johnny went down the street, oh my goodness, you know, kind of thing, right? You know, you just cannot let go. You have to control every single move, their friends, their habits. And then when they grow up, they're still sitting on your couch, eating Cheetos, playing video games when they're in their 20s, right? Okay? Or how about in our love relationships, right? We, we'll, we'll go, we'll, we'll vilify somebody when things start going wrong. We'll say, I can't believe I went out with that person or I got married to that person. They're so jacked up, right? You know, like, really? You're the one that's jacked up, okay? Because you went out with them. You know, and we do this all the time with relationships. We sit there and we view them from this functional savior perspective where we're just throwing duct tape on it. It's called the white knuckling effect, right? We can only do so much. It calls for us to need something greater. You know, just this last week, I mean, and it's always just the little things in a relationship, right, that will set everything off. Right? Just this last week, see, I am an electronic calendar schedule person, okay? I have got to have everything into my electronic calendar so my little phone will let me know when I need to go do something, okay? Right? That's the way I live my life. I know it's sad, okay? <laughs> my wife likes the handwritten calendar on the, the refrigerator, okay? I can't do that because, one, you can't read my handwriting, all right, so she wouldn't know what was happening anyways. So she was being very generous and said, well, we'll just do the shared electronic calendar. Well, I went to enter in all my son's soccer games, okay? As I entered them in, I entered in the start of the game. Well, the coach likes everybody to be there 30 minutes early. I didn't enter it in 30 minutes early. She had to take my son to the soccer game yesterday and she was 30 minutes late because he wasn't there 30 minutes early, right? So I get the phone call like, Oh, I'm like, right? So I could have easily gone and said, do it my way or the highway, you know? Or, duh, you should have thought, you know, we've always arrived 30 minutes early. Why did we arrive 30 minutes early, you know? But it would have been putting me in the center. I would have been the one that would have come in and said, yeah, let me fix this for you. Why do we do this? Is because we don't believe. 
Simply, we do not believe God's promises and his word when it comes to this. We do not believe that God can be in the center of our relationships or that he even deserves to be in the center if we're truthful sometimes. We think that we're so good at it that we've got it under control. So when I and you are at the center, we create this break in community and becomes a me versus you. And every conflict leads to a polarization. I am right, you are wrong. Or we tend to think economically about our relationships. Basically, do I have enough time to invest in you? Do I really feel like I've just got enough energy to invest in you? Everything is all about you and how much do you have to put out in order to have a relationship? You may even do the right thing because you're a Christian, but you'll do it begrudgingly. You'll go, all right, fine, I'm going to help you, but just know that I'm going out of my way, okay? I'm going to let you know it about 12 times, okay? You end up using others. You get out of them what you can before you get hurt. That's why we wind up in using other people, right? Because we're afraid that if we get into a relationship with this individual, this is gonna, the conflict's going to come, and things are going to go bad, and then we won't be friends any longer, and then that's it. So I'll just use you and get what I want, and then I'm out of there. We do this very well with military families. We come into a new community every couple years, we were in survival mode, and we look out and we go, okay, who, who has what I need? Okay, I've got those things. I'll use those people because I know in just a couple years I'm going to be gone. We do this very well in the church, too. We come to church, and we say, okay, there's a good children's ministry. There is good worship. There is this. There's a message that makes me feel good at the end of the day. Fantastic. I'll go to the church, but I'm not going to connect. I'm not going to plug in. I'm just going to sit back and use what I can get. See, this pattern is what happens when we view everyone else's sins to be greater than ours. But I want to quantify something here before I go on. See, if you're in an abusive relationship... If you're in a relationship where somebody's beating you, molesting you, raping you, who is doing horrible atrocities to you, get out of the relationship. Run. Get out of that relationship. It, God loves you and is going to work things for, you, for the good. But don't vilify or demonize them. Don't slander them. But seek justice, yes. But you don't have to stick around in that relationship. And I say that with trepidation because the fact that I know that some of you are going to go, Ed told me that you're an abuser when it's really just a hard time in a, in a relationship. You're going to, to abuse that term. And that's why I tried to use some words that were a little offensive, that would wake you up. So unless those things are happening, then you probably need to stick with it in a gospel-centered community a little bit longer. But however, with God in the center, every relationship can be transformed. Which means every conflict then is an opportunity for gospel growth. See, one of Jesus' disciples said it this way. 1 John 2, 9 through 11. He says, Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light. And in him there is no cause for stumbling. Stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Also in 1 John 1, 7, it says, But if we walk in the light as he, Jesus, is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us all from sin. If we say we have no sin, we've deceived ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. See, when we make it a you versus me, we no longer believe that God is in the center of all things. Essentially, we're walking around in darkness. What happens when we walk around in darkness? Have you ever bought a new piece of furniture in the middle of the night you got to get up? Right? You know where I'm going. And you think, I've got this. I don't need to turn the light on. I'll know where it is. And about that time, oh, that's going to leave a mark in the morning, right? Okay? And that's what we do in relationships. If we sit there and say that I don't have a sin issue and my sin problem is not going to affect this relationship that I have with another person, we're essentially walking around in darkness. And what's going to happen? We're going to stumble and we're going to get hurt and we're going to hurt the other person with us. So confession and repentance is the way that we need to go. See, if we confess our sins, we have essentially turned the light back on. We don't have to be right. You don't have to let something petty like a calendar get in the way of your repentance and your confession. See, with God in the center, I can also learn to think graciously about relationships. Philippians 2, 3 through 8 says this, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not lonely Look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God to be a thing or a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of a man, being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Does this sound like Jesus? Does this sound like God had economy relationship in mind here? Does it sound like he held back when he did everything, where he poured everything out just so that we could have a relationship with him again. Thank goodness he didn't. Thank goodness he did not. And see, this is how we should live in community together. Gospel-centered community together. If we live it the way that Jesus did, he poured everything out just so you and I could have a relationship. And because Jesus poured everything out on the cross, you and I can love each other and not use each other. People are not a means to my end. God will be, a mean, will be my end. See, 1 John 3, 16 through 18 says this, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for other brothers. But if anyone has the world's Goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him. How does God, God's love, abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. See, true love was given to us not as something that God used to coerce or to corrupt, but It's to be this point to where God becomes the center of our relationships. It's it's not a weapon to be used to gain something. But it should show how great God is because he first loved us. So when we go into relationships and instead of wondering where that hurt's going to come, no that when we go into them, there might be some pain because we're fallen. I'm, I'm going to mess things up. I'm just being honest, right? I know you're going to mess things up. 
But if we can go into them, we can show how great God is because his love will overcome so much. When we allow God to be the center of our gospel communities, then love is not that weapon any longer. But why would we ever accept this false love? Why do we ever accept functional saviors? Why do we accept this? Why do we accept duct tape as the real thing, right? We accept false love because of our unbelief. We simply refuse to believe that God's love is better. It's sad. Or maybe we don't believe what God has said will really happen in our lives. Maybe we'll say, okay, that's for everybody else. It's just not going to happen for me. I can tell you, God can transform our lives through his spirit. When we tell God that we don't need him or his divine power to change our lives, to rescue our relationships, we're essentially telling God, I don't need you. I'm a better savior. I don't trust you to save me. But I'm telling you, Jesus is a better savior. Jesus is the better Savior. Because at the cross, Jesus was rejected and betrayed by his friends. He could have said, you know what? I'm right. You're wrong. You guys go, go destroy yourselves. I could have called 10,000 angels to take care of me. But he didn't. He said, I'm going to die for you. God the Father even had to turn his back on Jesus. And Jesus is the better Savior because he's gone through a worse relationship breakup than you and I ever had. Can you imagine the pain of God the Father turning his back on you? Jesus is the better Savior because Jesus gave up being the center of his own world. He stepped out of glory. He stepped out of heaven into humanity, into the mess just so we could have a restored, living, breathing, loving, growing relationship with God. If Jesus trusted God to be the center of his life, then so can you. And God can be trusted because he sent Jesus to die for me. This shows he truly cares about me and my deepest needs, having restored relationships. See, in 2 Peter 3, 1 through 4, it says this, His divine power is granted to us, to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of this divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Did you catch that? Again, his divine power has been granted to us. Has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. <laughs> I, I, I can't get over that. All things, again, all things that pertain to life and godliness. And this is not just some superhuman power here we're talking about. You're not going to be able to run really fast. You're not going to be able to turn invisible. You're not going to fly like Superman, okay? This is God-given divine power to do greater things than run really fast and be invincible by a bullet, okay? I mean, we're talking the ability to restore relationships. When Everything is broken around you. God has given you his divine power through his spirit to restore relationships. And that it's through his divine spirit, his divine power that he's given us through the Holy Spirit that relationships really can matter. We can have relationships that are more than a bunch of non-authentic friends on Facebook. We can get through struggles and pains of relationships by, his, by the Holy Spirit's power and for his glory. 
Through the divine power, we can believe the Spirit is more powerful than our need for self-protection. We can believe the Holy Spirit helps us know and experience God's love. We can, if we withhold ourselves from relationships, we're refusing to let the Spirit use us in the lives of others. If we withhold ourselves from relationships, we're refusing to let the Spirit use us in the lives of others. See, God is not just redeeming us. Again, it's not just about you. He has invited us to take part of that work that is already going on in the lives of other people that you're in community with. Imagine that every single struggle, conflict, pain, and broken relationship is an opportunity for us to worship God more deeply and be formed more fully into his image. Imagine a community that has God in the center of their community where we are forgiving each other for getting it wrong because Jesus is greater and worshiping him with our relationship that brings the image of God more clearly into focus. Do you want to be a part of that community today? As we all stand and rise, and everyone, if you would bow your heads, close your eyes. Do you have broken relationships? Are you always the one who has to be right? Do you think economically about people? Do you use others before getting hurt? Jesus has suffered because of you. And maybe you need to repent and ask forgiveness today. Maybe you see God, see that God has not been the center of your life, and you need to rededicate that life back to him. Or you may not even know God today. You see that you may need to start a relationship with him.